This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Deepwater Horizon was a monument to human engineering. Ten years ago, it was the latest example of the technological heights of mankind. Through a clever mix of innovation and exploration, we were able to build structures and tap resources that would have been thought absolutely impossible just one or two generations prior. Unfortunately, the story of Deepwater Horizon was also a towering inferno of human greed, an already risky project that placed its 500 million dollar structure and its priceless crew in obvious and foreseeable danger. But what exactly happened, and why is it still relevant today? Well, let's head down to Louisiana, to the Gulf of Mexico. It didn't take long for our early 20th century forefathers to realize that oil would be a critically important energy resource in modern life. Oil wells were constructed in North America as early as the 1890s, with different excursions in California, the Gulf region, and the American Midwest probing beneath lands and rivers. By the 1930s, oil hounds in the Louisiana bayou had grown used to drilling for oil in the marshlands, and so they began edging out into the Gulf of Mexico, using everything from barge to homemade wooden platforms built on a foundation of oyster shells. After a brief pause during World War II, oil-minded Americans were back on the bayou in 1945, and by 1947, Oklahoma Energy Company Kerr McGee had built the first offshore oil platform that was completely out of sight of land. The oil rush exploded from there. If the 19th century boom was Americans headed west in search of gold, then the 20th century must have been their return to the south in search of its liquid black counterpart. Oil rigs could be seen across the landscape from Alaska to Alabama, but nowhere felt the rush quite like Texas and Louisiana. Boomtowns completely changed the face of the Texas economy in the early 1900s, and then again in the 1970s as instability in the Middle East created a massive economic surge in Texas and the surrounding areas. In the Gulf, offshore platforms continued to drift farther and farther away from the shore as oil companies like Chevron and BP continued to learn just how profitable the Gulf of Mexico could be. By the year 2000, there were 1,200 wells drilled in areas of the Gulf that were deeper than 1,000 feet. So here's how a new oil well gets drilled. An exploratory team takes a specialized sonar ship out to the Gulf of Mexico, which at 1.6 million square kilometers is a little more than half the size of the Mediterranean. The boat shoots sound waves down to the bottom of the sea, mapping individual parts of the sea floor as well as the subterranean layers immediately below that. Computers create a three-dimensional model of that particular part of the Gulf, and geologists use this model to identify pockets where oil could be trapped. An exploratory drill rig will open up temporary wells where geologists geologists can take core samples. From there, the geologists and the oil companies that they work for can make a pretty good guess at the quality and quantity of oil present in one particular location. Petroleum companies have repeated this process again and again for 75 years, steadily expanding their presence in the Gulf of Mexico until they reach the outer continental shelf, the portion of the Gulf usually a few hundred meters off the shore, where the depth really drops down to huge four-digit numbers. Even 50 years ago, petroleum explorers could map the bottom of the outer shelf and identify potential oil pockets, but they usually didn't have the technology to securely build wells that could access oil that deep underground. It wasn't until the end of the 20th century that the drilling technology caught up with the sonar technology and we could make all the mechanics and electronics that operate from a modern oil rig. And about that oil rig, it might not be what you're envisioning. When I think of oil rigs, I think of the old tiny towers and wells that dot the prairies of the American West, but modern oceanic rigs called mobile offshore drilling units aren't necessarily stationary towers built in a fixed location in the Gulf. Rigs that are designed for use in depths that exceed 1,500 meters are mobile docks, dynamically positioned and controlled by computer-powered thrusters. Okay, so with that bit covered, now you might be wondering, well, how does this drilling affect marine life? That's a topic big enough for its own video, but to put it really simply, 
there are some effects, but they aren't necessarily bad. Energy companies will invest in an environmental impact assessment before beginning a new exploratory procedure with parameters based on updated marine information that's specific to that region. There is some concern about the effect of the exploratory sonic waves used to find oil, but investigations have been inconclusive so far. After a well is used up and a rig's operation is no longer profitable, companies are required to seal the well and return the seafloor to its previous condition. In the case of older stationary rigs, they may even be left as an artificial reef for the marine life that has made a home around it. In other words, when everything goes according to plan, the oil industry and the environment can coexist with a modest level of harmony. Unfortunately, though, accidents are inevitable, and nothing ever goes as planned forever. Whatever else it is, Deepwater Horizon is a wonderfully poetic name. You might be inclined to think that Deepwater Horizon is some beautiful spot in the Gulf of Mexico with picturesque oceanic sunsets, but Deepwater Horizon is actually the name of the oil rig. Deepwater Horizon was a technologically advanced offshore drilling rig built by Hyundai Heavy Industries in Ulsan, South Korea from 1998 to 2001. Originally, the project was commissioned for a Houston-based energy company called R&B Falcon, but by the time the project was completed, a Swiss company called Transocean had bought R&B Falcon and its 115 drilling rigs for $5 billion. At the time, the purchase gave Transocean control of the largest fleet of offshore drilling rigs in the world. Deepwater Horizon was a massive feat of modern engineering. It was a 21st century mobile offshore drilling unit with all the technology that entails. It was a large vessel that was dynamically positioned with modern computer infrastructure that read and tracked real-time updates from every part of the drill. In 2002, not long after it was built and ferried to the Gulf of Mexico. It was updated with an even more advanced computer program called eDrill that allowed additional technical support in Houston, Texas to monitor data readouts and provide troubleshooting support if necessary. The crown jewel of a rig like Deepwater Horizon, both industrially and technologically, is the drill and accompanying safety equipment. Deepwater Horizon featured a deep-sea drill and blowout preventers that protected it from up to 100,000 kilopascals of pressure, which is roughly the same amount of pressure on an object that would be at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. That's the deepest part of the known ocean, and five to ten times deeper than most of the ultra-deep drill locations in the Gulf of Mexico. If at any point the rig computer senses dangerous pressure building up in any part of the drill or piping, the rig has the intelligence and ability to shutter that portion and protect it from the pressure. If a hole bursts in any part of the drill, the rig can actually glue itself back together using waterproof cement. It's actually pretty extremely cool. In 2001, when Deepwater Horizon was fully built, it was leased to British Petroleum. The original lease ran through 2004, and it was renewed three times in 2004, 2005, and 2009. By the final contract, BP was paying Transocean about $500,000 per day to drill for oil with Deepwater Horizon. It was, at the time, one of the most valuable and powerful tools in the world, and that's partially because of its drilling capabilities. Because of its advanced technology, Deepwater Horizon was able to drill deeper than just about any underwater rig that had ever been built. It could operate in water as deep as 8,000 feet, which is about 2.5 kilometers. It had an estimated maximum drill depth of 30,000 feet, or about 9 kilometers. Few other rigs in existence could even come close to that. On more than one occasion, industry experts described it as one of the most powerful rigs in the world. For the decades that Deepwater Horizon was in use, it made BP a lot of money. It worked in the Thunderhorse oil field, which is about 150 miles south of New Orleans. It also worked at the Atlantis site, which is the third largest oil field in the Gulf. Five years into its life cycle, Deepwater Horizon discovered the massive Cascada oil fields in Keithy Canyon, which experts believe to contain roughly 3 billion barrels of oil. Because it discovered the field, BP owns a 70% stake, which has a current market capitalization north of 40 billion US dollars. 
Not long after discovering Cascada, BP and Deepwater Horizon were at the center of an even bigger find, the Tiber oil field, expected to contain about four to six billion barrels of oil. That $40 billion that BP had just found, well, this field could be worth twice that. So in the middle of 2009, 41 miles from the coast of Louisiana, BP began preparing to drill one of the deepest underground wells in the history of the world, knowing that a massive fortune was just waiting for them below the surface. And well, a massive fortune might be waiting for you if you start a new business and you build the website with today's sponsor, Squarespace. Now, a couple of simple things. Maybe you've got some idea for a business that's going to make you an absolute ton of money. Probably not offshore drilling. Let's just say that that's, you know, a small percentage of people, but maybe it's something else. And well, the second thing is the only way to figure out if that idea is good, whether it's worth pursuing, is to get it out to the world and see if people like it. And to get it out to the world, you're probably going to need a website website and you should do that with Squarespace. Squarespace allows you to create a beautiful website for whatever you're up to. You want to sell something online? Yes, you can set up a store with Squarespace. So you want to do a podcast starting a YouTube channel? Well, you definitely want a website to go along with that. And you can have a podcast on a Squarespace website. How great is that? It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content or just start from scratch if you've got design chops. But maybe just go with the templates. It's a lot easier. Like I say, don't make an excuse and just get started. Started, it's super easy. And once you've gone through that easy customization process, there are no updates, there's no patches, there's no tech BS that you have to deal with, no one likes any of that stuff. Also, Squarespace handle all of the website stuff. Like I say, they do podcasts, they also do social integrations, mailing lists, and a whole lot more. Squarespace removes the excuses from attaining your dreams. Go get started today, just do it. Also, 24-7 customer support in case you get stuck, but you probably won't. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back to it. BP tried to begin drilling in the Tiber field in the fall of 2009 with a rig called the Transocean Marianas, but it was damaged by Hurricane Ida in November and the project was delayed. Deepwater Horizon was scheduled to take over when the calendar flipped over to 2010. By the time Deepwater Horizon was in position to resume drilling the Tiber, the exploratory site had been given a name. BP had run a contest among its employees as part of a United Way campaign asking for recommendations on what to name the first well site inside the Tiber oil field. The entry they selected? The Macondo Prospect, named after the cursed town in the novel 100 Years of Solitude. Even by Deepwater Horizon's best-in-the-world standards, Macondo was an impressive undertaking. The original well that Deepwater Horizon drilled for core samples in 2009 was in 4,130 feet of water, and it drilled through another 31,000 feet of earth below that. In total, the well had a measured depth of 35,055 feet. It was the deepest well in the history of the world, so deep that if you were to run a 10k down through the earth, starting at the surface and running towards the earth's core, you would reach the end of the race before you'd reach the bottom of the well. On the first day that Deepwater Horizon began drilling at Macondo in February 2010, the project was already behind schedule. As a result, the team working on the drill was pushing the pace, trying to make up for time lost due to the hurricane and the holidays. BP instructed the crew to cut some corners. For example, they asked to speed up the installation of the well's concrete frame by introducing nitrogen. The concrete would set faster, but at the expense of some structural integrity. In March, the crew began ignoring warning signs that something was wrong for fear of being penalized for not keeping to the project schedule. The blowout prevention equipment began leaking fluid. Gaseous pressure from underneath the seabed was higher than normal. Methane had escaped through the well on more than one occasion, and the drill would sometimes experience some kickback, sending shockwaves all the way through to the rig above it. As the calendar inched into April, the problems got even more serious. One incident damaged the blowout preventer, but for some reason, it was never officially documented. A memo suggests that there were some serious issues with viability of the cement. An email from a BP executive stated the Deepwater Horizon may need to completely plug back the well. Instead of taking a conservative approach, BP continued to accept the risks and carry on towards the multi-billion dollar oil reserve as fast as possible. As BP neared the end of April, the exploratory well was just a few more days from being completed. 
On April the 20th, 2010, there was mounting data that gas was bubbling into the well, one of the clearest and most obvious signs of a potential blowout. But the project was five weeks behind schedule, and the crew on board didn't want to do anything dramatic. On top of that, BP Vice President of Drilling Patrick O'Brien was scheduled to helicopter out to Deepwater Horizon at supper time for a small party. O'Brien wanted to congratulate the crew for seven full years of operation without a lost time incident. About two hours after O'Brien's arrival, pressure inside the oil rig hit a critical point. The drill experienced a massive blowout, spewing oil and mud thousands of feet up and into the rig. Soon after, with the well containment breached, methane gas that was trapped underground throttled upward. The methane ignited and Deepwater Horizon exploded in a massive fireball. There were 126 people on board at the time. The explosion and the chaos that resulted immediately afterward killed 11 people. Many of the rest found a way off the rig, escaping it as it burned and sank into the ocean. The US Coast Guard conducted an extensive search and rescue operation, and 17 people were evacuated by helicopter to trauma centers in Alabama and Louisiana. The majority of the survivors were taken to a nearby supply boat, the Damon Bankston, with no major injuries. They were interviewed by the Coast Guard for several hours before eventually being taken to a hotel in Kenna, Louisiana, where they were given food, showers, and medical attention. By April the 22nd, Deepwater Horizon had sunk into the Gulf of Mexico. It was found on the bottom of the seabed half a mile away. Beyond the cost in human lives, the Deepwater Horizon incident quickly became the worst accidental oil spill ever. Just as a rig is supposed to contain contingencies that prevent blowouts like the one that wrecked Deepwater Horizon, they're also supposed to contain contingencies that seal the well in the event of an emergency. In a situation this bad, the final contingency is something called a blind shear ram, which is designed to cut through the drill and cap off the well all at once. At Deepwater Horizon, that contingency failed, leaving oil spilling into the Gulf of Mexico. The spill was discovered two days after the explosion, when a large oil slick appeared at the original site of the rig. And recall now that the Macondo Prospect, the site named for a cursed town, was one block of a massive oil field, holding hundreds of millions of barrels of oil. BP projected that the well began to leak a thousand gallons of oil into the Gulf every day. Analysis by the US government eventually determined that the initial leak rate was more like 60,000. It took 87 days for BP to cap the well. BP and its partners first had to manually seal the well with remote-controlled underwater robots that could approach and plug the hole that they had drilled in the bottom of the gulf. BP constructed a series of relief wells to control the flow. The remainder of the Macondo Prospect is considered dead and inaccessible. In total, the Deepwater Horizon incident was responsible for 210 million gallons of oil spilt, nearly 20 times worse than the wreck of the 1989 Exxon Valdez. It killed tens of thousands of animals, sickened hundreds of Americans that lived on the Gulf shore, wasted a trove of non-renewable resources, and cost the United States billions of dollars to clean up. After a disaster of this scale, two things are pretty much guaranteed. Investigations and lawsuits. BP, Transocean, and the US government all conducted massive internal inquiries into how something like this could have happened with predictable results. There were fundamental problems around the construction of the well. The waterproof cement was ineffective. Rig operators failed to monitor and correctly interpret key data in the hours before the blowout. Failsafes and contingencies did not work as designed. A U.S. congressional investigation determined that BP made a number of risky decisions during the Deepwater Horizon incident that were specifically designed to save time and money at the cost of ignoring safety regulations. At times, the company appears to have ignored the advice of their own engineers. This backed up an earlier revelation from rig owner Transocean. In the week before the explosion, Transocean conducted an anonymous survey of Deepwater Horizon staffers and discovered that many workers feared that that they would face reprisals or punishments for raising safety concerns about operational safety. The report draws directly from worker feedback, concluding that drilling priorities were taking precedence over maintenance. In some instances, workers were even entering fake data to maintain the veneer of safety. While investigations were playing out both in the government and in the media, BP CEO Tony Hayward actually managed to make things worse. Hayward badly mangled a series of public statements in the weeks after the spill, earning himself an appearance on the American TV satire South Park. Ultimately, his apologies mattered very little in the United States, as BP's reputation was completely annihilated by Deepwater Horizon. He was replaced as CEO on October the 1st. 
five and a half months after the explosion. In the end, everyone involved faced massive financial penalties. BP paid more than $20 billion, including $8 billion for natural resource damage. Transocean paid $1.4 billion in a fine tied to the U.S. Clean Water Act, but received an insurance settlement for the wreck of Deepwater Horizon that was north of $500 million. Halliburton, the contractor responsible for creating the cement, paid $1.1 billion into a trust that was dispersed to multiple parties. Naturally, when something huge like this happens in the 21st century, there's a great influx of documentary porn. Every American with a liberal arts degree and an iPhone 4 released some kind of video investigation cataloging the sublime hazards of what can happen if you poke a hole in the bottom of the world without proper precautions. There was the big fix, the great invisible, pretty slick after the spill dispatches from the Gulf, BP in deep water, the list goes on. Even more interesting than the documentaries were the dramas. Screenwriter Aaron Sorkin, who wrote A Few Good Men and The Social Network and a bunch of other stuff your friend won't shut up about, wrapped a great deal of his pilot for HBO's The Newsroom around the events of Deepwater Horizon. You may have seen the opening seven minutes of the show shared on social media, where actor Jeff Daniels gives a blistering seven-minute monologue about how America is no longer the greatest country in the world, but most of the rest of the episode, believe it or not, is actually about Deepwater Horizon. That show premiered in 2012, 26 months after the events, and the episode follows a team of young reporters through a complicated day in their fictional newsroom. The characters debate whether or not their coverage should focus on the search and rescue missions or the potential negligence that may have led to the event in the first place. Later, when it becomes clear that the underwater well can't be cemented shut, Jeff Daniels' character asks a US official why no one seems to have the technology to prevent the world's most predictable emergency. Four years after it showed up on HBO, Hollywood completed the cycle with a big-budget feature film. Few things are more American than dramatizing a tragedy after enough time has passed, which is how Mark Wahlberg ended up as the star of the film in 2016's Deepwater Horizon, a based-on-a-true-story account of the explosion that raked in $121 million internationally. The movie focuses on three rig workers, played by Mark Wahlberg, Kurt Russell, and Gina Rodriguez. They try to save as many people as they can following the blowout. Deepwater Horizon, the film, makes a clear point about the cost of greed and dehumanized corporate perspectives, but it's less a lecture on people over profits than it is a testament to the bravery and quick thinking that many of the real-life crew members had to exhibit in April of 2010. It's an unsurprising formula, given that director Peter Berg also directed The Kingdom, Lone Survivor, and Patriot's Day. And maybe Berg's decision to center his story on heroism rather than homily is the only good way to tell a story like this. Ask any group of school-aged children, and they'll be able to tell you that hurting people for money is wrong. It seems that toddlers and business executives are the only two groups of people that need to be continuously reminded of this. A hundred million dollar lecture on safety might seem overly obtuse, though, so as an alternative, Deepwater Horizon shows us both extremes of the human condition. The caustic greed that reigns chaos on innocent bystanders, but also the bravery and the selflessness that humanity can summon in its deepest despairs and darkest hours. Perhaps Berg was right to focus on the positives. As historians, though, we have a different calling. Reflect on our mistakes, so that we might avoid making them again. Ten years after an explosion that killed 11 Americans and affected countless people, animals, and businesses, we would do well to remember the bloody greed that sprang up from the cavernous reaches underneath the Gulf of Mexico. Deepwater Horizon is unlikely to be the last man-made disaster to ever stain our shores, but with grounded priorities and effective regulation, it might just be the last unnecessary one. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor Squarespace, who I'm going to link to below. And thank you for watching.